Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. Today is Sunday, January the 23rd, 2022. And welcome to the Mbongi. And today's discussion is titled Demonstration Beats Conversation. How to critique the critique. And I will inform you more about what I mean by that when we return in just a moment. Welcome, welcome. And again, this is the Mbongi, and I am your host, the Sarm Hotel. And we have with us a, uh, we are going to have today a, a very dynamic and uh, critical discussion about how to critique the critique. And as stated in the, um, description i'm going to show how i answered two uh scholars who were trying to make arguments against uh dr shekanta diop and uh dr till follow Benga. and so you know we we all understand that you know once you write some text and you put uh, an argument together and you release it publicly, it is going to be scrutinized. That's that's without a doubt. And so this has nothing to do with race. It has uh, nothing to do with gender, age. It's just part of the academic process. And this is healthy because, you know, public scrutiny allows for us to refine our arguments and and seek better uh argumentation and evidence so that we can get closer to the truth and that we can have a a body of solid evidence uh, excuse me a, a body of solid scholarship that we can utilize to make a better world right uh but every now and then you you find certain critiques that are either malice uh just off and and sometimes those bad critiques are utilized by others to try to discredit a particular scholar because whoever the person is that's doing the critique has uh, a bit of prestige or power uh, even if not really like they're in their field it could be like a socioeconomic even racial thing in in terms of who's providing the critique upon whom and so this is why when you when you go to university and you're you're taking those classes on research methods uh you usually really do that in your master's you know program but some institutions i'm familiar with um they they do at least have some level of research methods uh integrated into their uh their courses but you know this is this is why you have to kind of locate the author and to see where their orientation is uh so it can better help you understand the nature of the critique in which they are providing 
And so, as I stated at the beginning, all research is uh, subject to critique. So no one is above critique. That's not the issue at hand here. The issue is when those critiques are not well grounded in the knowledge of the subject, in the the logic, the inner logic of the presentation, um, or a full comprehension of what the original author for whom we're critiquing is, is trying to say or what other evidence that may be used to build up in terms of their argument. So there are many factors here. So saying all of that to say that, you know, many of us, especially those who are not researchers, but are enthusiasts and are involved in this so-called conscious community, right? And, you know, in, in, in this public social media space, you have individuals who are genuinely, genuinely uh, passionate about you know, whatever subject it is that they're passionate about. And so they, they'll read certain things and then they get into conflicts online about the nature and the merit of some information. And as a result of that, they will uh, try to discredit, you know, another person who they're they're having the disagreement with. And one of their ways that they try to discredit the person that they're having the disagreement with is to, you know, Google search and find some author who has a disagreement with the, the position and or author that the other person who, who they are in disagreement with is using against them. Right. And so what's what's terrible about this approach is that one, the individuals who do that, who purposely look for the critiques, they never they never almost simultaneously look for the critiques of the critiques. Right. So let's say, you know, you have scholar A who who wrote you know, a paper or a book and there's something or the entire argument is is found to be uh, unintelligible to uh, another scholar. They're, they're arguing that it's false, right? So what will happen is somebody in the social media space will, will find the researcher B and then look at their critique and then try to use that in the argument that they're having on social media to try to discredit researcher A. And this is problematic for several reasons. For one, did researcher A respond to researcher B? And what was the nature of the response? Was there a researcher C? that responded to researcher B. What were their critiques on the critique of researcher B? Of course, when you're in this social media space, you're not, or oftentimes people are not researching because they have a love and desire for the research and they're really genuinely trying to get at the heart of the research question, what they're trying to do is win a social media argument. And so when they when they do that, they'll just look for any old information. And when they do that, they'll just, you know, it seems like it's legit. This person may have the credentials, you know, researcher B. And then they'll they'll take researcher B's argument and try to use it against researcher A. But 
when we are talking about the academic and research community, we have to remember that if you are making arguments, we're not just talking about the casual reader, the just the genuine enthusiast that isn't involved in any uh, debates and arguments online or on paper anywhere. We're just talking about the general, the general reader. If the general reader comes across these arguments, they'll just sit back and kind of weigh everything and then just come to their own uh, conclusion in silence. But this person who is trying to make public arguments using other people's arguments, the, the same criteria that is and credentials that are needed for researcher A and researcher B is also needed for the the person making the critique. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the credentials like if they have a PhD in, in this, that you have to have a PhD. What I mean is that you have to have the requisite skills in order to critique research B, researcher B's analysis of researcher A. You just can't use their critique blindly because you don't know if the critique has merit itself. So you have to be competent in the field of study to use researcher B's critique on researcher A in a very serious way because you have to vet researcher B's information. So you just don't wholeheartedly because somebody takes an argument, somebody has an argument uh, against another researcher that you just you just automatically just use it and then we wash our hands with the subject. It's said and done. That's not how this works. Now you're involved in the, the total argument. So now you are uh, to be questioned just as much as researcher A or researcher B. You're part of the you're part of the loop now. So if if you don't have the competency in the field to to be able to analyze both arguments, your usage of researcher B's critique of researcher A is is null and void. Because you will miss these, these key fundamental factors of the arguments. And so that's essentially what we're going to do, what we're going to deal with today in terms of the examples that I'm going to use. And so remember that this doesn't, it this goes for anyone. So let's say that you uh like somebody has a, uh, like, let's say researcher A has a very racist argument, right? About the the intellectual capacity of, of African people, right? And then we have researcher B, who's an African who makes a critique against researcher A. Now, it would seem morally and ethically that we should ride with researcher B because this person is African and you know they're they're critiquing a racist. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, researcher B's argument in unto itself, regardless to who he is, has to be grounded in facts. It has to be sound and well formed. The information itself, independent of the individual, has to be solid. So it doesn't matter if it's, it's for or against your position. All everybody's subject to the same criteria. So I hope that you know all of this is making sense. So you know with that background, I want to start from the beginning and shout out everyone who has made themselves known in the chat. So peace to Teti Ursa Maat Ross and Neferu. Thank you for joining. Peace and blessings to Emmanuel Adama and Phi Lightentist. Peace and blessings to you. 
Donnie Williams is in the building. The entire Mosi Warrior clan. I don't know which one of y'all it is, but I'm just going to shout out the entire Mosi Warrior clan. Thank you for joining. We got Vyasa, Nicolo, Gula, Gula Geechee in the building. Peace and blessings to you. Thank you for joining. All the way across the waters, we got Brother Conan Lee. Thank you for joining. I got this little heater on. I don't even know if y'all can hear that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shout out to you. Peace and blessings. Uh, Any Herrick, Calfani, Sean P. in the building. Thank you for joining us. We got the queen. Ladosha Wright is in the building. Thank you for joining. Peace and blessings. Sister Tamika, always good to have you. Thank you for joining. Got the eyes and the popcorn uh, going. She ready. <laughs> we have Brother Sheffron, Elon to L. Uh, so, you know, Sheffron and changed up on us. Now he a Hebrew Israelite. Shout out to Brother Sheffron and the um, whole uh, pseudo killers clan. Peace and blessing to you. Thank you for joining uh peace and blessings brother dejed m ank hekara from the uh <laughs> comics cube y'all make sure y'all check uh his channel out online and peace and blessings to you thank you for joining rick x factor with the bullseye is in the building thank you for joining strife is in the building shout out to you and shout out to brother sunjiata ata Cockra and Zombie with the the first super chat. Peace and blessings. He says, uh, thoughts on the make West Africa sexy conversation. I am unfamiliar with that conversation. You're going to have to tell me what that is and uh, where where that conversation is, is had. So I, I, I truly don't know what that conversation is. So uh, hit me up and let me know. And let me see here. Brother Kansu, the real new Wapian, is in the building. He says, that's true. Reminds me when Sean Any Harris said that the word Sahu in Metanetra didn't translate as or or uh Orion uh, or Orion. I'm, I can't even speak today. Orion. And I showed him directly in the pyramid text, yet he still refuses to accept this fact. Um, well, you, you one could argue that. The word Sahu refers to uh, the star Orion, but doesn't necessarily translate as Orion. Those are two different things. So uh, part of being a good researcher is, is putting more well-formed uh, questions, research questions, so that it is not ambiguous and it can be, you know, answered in a number of ways. So... Uh, don't know. I'm not joining that conversation, but peace and blessings and shout out to you for joining the program. Bitmax is in the building. Peace and blessings to you. Uh, that good guy, not the bad guy, but that good guy has made it in the building and peace and blessings to you as well. Shout out to Bantu history. Always love Bantu languages and cultures. Always welcome uh, here at the Mbongi. Uh, Corey, the anti-theist, is in the building. Peace and blessings to you. And Coma, the Jed, bless ups, respect to you. Uh, LaDonna Whiteside, peace and blessings to you. Thank you for joining. And Marion Allen, all the way from Laurel, Mississippi. I, I have to go to Mississippi. I think, you know, I've been through Mississippi, but uh, that's to get to, to other states. But I haven't really just chilled there, and I and I need to and I need to make it there, uh, just just on on sacred travel grounds. I think everybody need to hit up Mississippi, Louisiana, and and uh, Alabama, um, and even Florida, and hit up the, the you know old maroon sites, and 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 those like be homage places, uh, you know, for our ancestors. So I got to do that before I leave this great green earth, earth, not earth, earth, U-R-F, earth. Anyway, peace and blessings. Thank you for joining. Black Panther Mossy in the building. Thank you for joining us. And we have TCC Pro Academy. 
Uh, thank you for joining us. And let me see. Tahar, oh, Taharka X. Thank you for joining. Peace and blessings. And ATL Superstar Show. ATL is in the building. Thank you for joining us. And Rowan Fall. Peace and blessings. And it is an honor to have you all. I think I shouted out everyone that has made themselves known. Nope. Sister Safa Rabah Muhammad has made herself known in the building. Peace and blessings. And thank you, Jagad Davis, for joining the program. So without further ado, I am going to get this mug started. But before we do that, I'm going to need each and every one of you to... That is right. I'm going to need y'all to Hulk smash the like button. I need you to share this video with friends and colleagues and everybody you just want to piss off today. And subscribe if you are new to this channel so that you can get all the updates and make sure that you hit the bell so that you get the notifications when we are starting trouble on these internet streets. So, what I'm going to do is share my screen. And we are going to go from there. So I'm going to just do full screen the entire presentation. And so, as I stated before, demonstration beats conversation. How to critique the critique. And, you know, uh, as I've stated before, you know, I've altered this phrase from Professor Manu M. Pim. Professor Manu M. Pim is a historian. And, and when he he made he used to make this statement that uh documentation beats demonstration. And in the field of history, that is true. However, my background is science. So anything can be documented but it's the ability to demonstrate that that wins the argument in uh in the day in in the science. So that's why I've altered his saying and I say demonstration beats conversation. And so we're going to see how this is done here today. <laughs> so let me here we go. So, did I have, okay. So the first, uh, and, and for those of you who, you know, kind of joined us late, as I stated at the beginning, beginning of our conversation, that the, we're going to do a case study. And so, you know, for those of you who have Aluja Volume 2, um, what I'm showing here is is part of the larger discussion from the intro. And so... But, you know, one thing that has always happened is that, you know, they, they try to make it seem as if African scholars only speak with and critique African scholars. This is not the case. We critique everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. You know, African scholarship is about the information. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're going to be dealing with two uh, European scholars <laughs> and but because they're European, that's that's not the issue here. But because they're European, it does play a role in the nature of the critique. And so the first critique is against uh, Dr. Teal Falobinga. And so this is a professor, Dr. Low key, I don't know if it's low key or if it's loke. I just want to say low key because of the Avengers. That's just me. But um, somebody you know who's familiar with this language and this name, you know, please correct me. But uh, Doctor Loke or Loki or Loki 
Van der Veen, uh, is a linguist and he deals primarily in African languages. And there is a book by the name of Becoming Eloquent, Advances in the Emergence of Language, Human Cognition, and Modern Cultures. And it is edited by Francesco de Erico and Jean-Marie Robert. Now, um, it is again because it's an edited work, there are different authors contributing, you know, for each chapter. So the title of his chapter, his chapter is actually a it's a co-authored chapter. Um, and it's titled Linguistic cultural and genetic perspectives on human diversity in West Central Africa. Now, the other authors, uh, what is this? Luis Quintana, uh, Murchie, and David Comas, they are the geneticists of, of the group. So he's the linguist and they're the geneticists. So I'm, I'm only going to deal with the linguistic uh, arguments uh, here. So the <laughs> excuse me so in the text on page 103 the author makes this statement he says that the uh, so he's talking about african scholars who have the audacity to do comparisons with modern african languages and ancient Egyptian language, right? So he's he's making the critique. He doesn't name names, but for those of us who do this, we automatically knew who he was talking about. So let's go. He says the alleged structural parallels, essentially sound correspondences between ancient Egypt and black African languages lack any scientific basis. They are merely non-systematic, randomly chosen chance similarities. Nowadays, languages are being compared with ancient languages, for example, in Boshi. And that C25 is just a categorized, uh, a category number for uh, the Bantu languages with ancient Egyptian. Core, therefore, basic lexicon is poorly represented. Moreover, as for the alleged typological similarities, it is a well-known fact that this kind of data is insufficient for proving affiliation. Now, there's, there's so much wrong with this. So let's just start at the beginning. So the alleged structural parallels, essentially sound correspondences between ancient Egypt and black African languages lack any scientific basis. So he didn't give a a language family he just said all black african languages so what he's arguing is that egypt doesn't belong to the black african universe and that the audacity to compare ancient egyptian language to black african languages is is unscientific right and this is this is problematic for so many reasons. So let's just say that, you know, regardless that Afroasiatic, Niger Congo, Khoisan, and uh what did I say? And Niger Congo are are a legit language phyla, right? In Afroasiatic are included languages like Omotic. Chadic, Berber, and of course the ancient Egyptian, right? And Cushitic languages. So now when you make a statement like between ancient Egypt and black African languages, are not Chadic speakers black folks? Are not the Cushitic speakers black folks? Like who is he talking about here so now you just nullified your entire uh i'm sorry that's brother sonetta call him I have to hit him back um 
this alleged, if, if this is Afro-Asiatic, so what you're saying is that all Afro-Asiatic languages are spoken by non-Black people. So this doesn't even make sense. Like, how did this get published? And so is Black African, you know, you're trying to say Sub-Saharan African? Like, what is, what are you saying here? Like, this is just, this is just not well formed at all. And so now he says they are merely non-systematic, randomly chosen chance similarities. Nowadays, languages are even being compared with ancient languages. Like, how dare you? You Negroes have the audacity to compare a Bantu language in Bochi with ancient Egyptian. You Negroes of out of your goddamn minds. Right? So this is a 2009 paper. Now, when he's talking about Mbochi, who is he talking about? Y'all should know because I kind of told y'all at the beginning. But he's, he's talking about Dr. Theofalo Benga because Dr. Theofalo Benga is the one who compares his native language. That's the name, that's the name of the language he speaks. That's the people he belonged to, the Mbochi. Some some will say Mbochi, and some will say Mboshi, but they're they're one and the same. They they interchange. So that's still follow Benga's language. So he's he's trying to take a stab at Obinga without mentioning his name. You don't do that in scholarship. If you have a critique against somebody, you name them. And then he tries to say that, you know, they're just merely non-systematic, randomly chosen chance similarities. And, and believe me when I say this, and when, when it comes to this page, that's why I made sure I gave y'all the source. So if y'all ever come across it and you want to purchase it, this is all that he states on this. There are no examples given in this text. And so as a result of he not providing because I want to see, you know, examples of these non systematic randomly. If you can see my hands with the quote, I'm, I'm putting the air quotes randomly chosen chance similarities. How are you going to make this statement in a peer reviewed publication and not provide examples of what you're talking about? So <laughs> Again, he, he's talking about Obinga, and this is the text here, uh, just translating to so the common origin of ancient Egyptian, of Coptic, and modern Black African languages, an introduction to African historical linguistics. This was published in 1993. And so in this text, Still Follow Obinga primarily compares his native language which is Mbochi to the ancient Egyptian. But he also supports his comparisons with Mbochi with other Black African languages. So you can, you can tell that he's using the language of Theophilo Binga, but not understanding exactly what it means. So I know what he's trying to say, and, he, and he's taking this from Obinga, because Obinga will talk about the comparison of Egyptian to Black African languages. But he's just he's just borrowing it with not without the context, because Obinga is is comparing many African languages with Egyptian, not just the standard ones that they believe are related uh, because of this hypothetical Afro Asiatic categorization. And so it's a complete analysis. So. I came across because I couldn't find him providing any examples in any of his work. I came across a presentation, right? And the the presentation, this is by the same author, uh, Vanderveen. And so now he finally provides some some 
uh, examples of what he's trying to make in terms of his argument. So the title of the, the presentation, hopefully it is still up, but you know, y'all can jot that down and y'all can look for the presentation. So he's trying to make an argument because there is a there is a legend among the Fong speaking people that they derive from ancient Egypt. It's, it's part of their oral tradition. And so his whole objective is to falsify that claim by the Fong people, right? So he does a presentation at some university, and, and this is from one of his slides. Um, okay. So Zane Montego says, I don't get, get what he means by chance comparison. And so, um, if I can explain briefly what, what, what that means. So it'll become clearer when I, when I give my responses to, uh, Dr. Vanderveen, but essentially and just like in any scientific endeavor, we're looking for patterns. And when we compare languages, we're looking for what we call regular, systematic, non-accidental sound and meaning correspondences between two or more languages. When we can see that regular pattern that is that cannot be attributed to chance, meaning it's an accident, it's coincidence. And so when we can we can um, provide that uh, those systematic correspondences, it eliminates chance as a reason for the pattern that we're seeing. So just like in the scientific in the scientific method, when you're doing an experiment, it is important that you do the experiment several different times, you know, lots of different times and and in in lots of different ways so that when 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 you're examining results, you're seeing a consistent pattern in the results that that force you to uh, conclude a particular conclusion. And so it's not it's not chance it's not a coincidence that what we're seeing is sound and valid because we've done this experiment a number of times that you know we we are ninety nine point whatever percent sure that this is an accurate description of reality and so it's the same thing in linguistics except you don't do physical experiments unless you're doing phonological experiments. You, you, you're doing basically math here and we're looking for the math. We're looking for the patterns. And so again, it's gonna be, it's gonna be very clear exactly what we mean. But what's funny is that in this, so uh, I forgot to give the title. So the, the title of the presentation was The Origins of the Fong, Language, Culture, and Genes, Myth or Reality, right? So, so this is his slide to try to discredit. And again, he doesn't name uh, Obinga. He's just, he's just taking Obinga's information, but not giving him credit for the uh for the information so again if for those of us who are, who are in this and do this every day anybody unless there's another researcher you know coming from his community nine times out of ten if you're seeing any kind of embochi and ancient egyptian correspondences it is dr theophilo binga right and so he he pre he presents this uh slide here and so you know the the meaning is on the left hand side and then of course the second column here is the embochi and then the third column is the coptic form and then in the uh 
the fourth column on the far right is the ancient Egyptian or Middle Egyptian form, right? So there's a word for snake. And so he compares it, Enzo, which in Coptic is Ajo, which in ancient Egyptian is Jet. So he says in Bochi, so what so so this is Obenga's entry on the first line. So now Dr. Vanderveen, he he tries to make his commentary, but Proto Bantu is Yoka. Right? So he's trying to he's trying to discredit Obinga here by saying, Well, I see this word and it appears that it matches, but Proto Bantu has Yoka which is irrelevant to the conversation. So then we go to this this third line here, the word for name in in uh for for these languages. So is is pronounced Dina in in Bochi. And then Ran in Coptic. And then just a consonant sequence R in in ancient Egyptian. But Proto Bantu has Yina and then D being the noun prefix. And then you have as this, this last entry here, palm tree. Ibia in Mbochi, Ba, Bai in, um, in Coptic, but he doesn't provide the ancient Egyptian form, which there is one for, for the New Kingdom Egyptian. And so, but he says, but proto-banter, proto-bantu, bida, or bida. And so his commentary, check under the, the table. He says, no regular correspondences, chance similarities. And he said this emphatically. This is, this is a quote. So you see the exclamation mark? So he... He said this emphatically, no regular correspondences at all. And so this is this is just funny because in his 2009 text, he states that people just randomly, that there, there are no merely non-systematic, randomly chosen chance similarity forms. But in his presentation, he just randomly takes words from Obinga's text and then tries to say that there's no regular correspondences. And this is the most disingenuous thing ever. Because I wonder if he really read the text. And so here is the entries from Dr. Theophile Obinga's 1993 text. <clears throat> that I showed earlier. And so when he makes the comparison, this is on page 191, we can see a systematic, because the minimum in linguistics to show a pattern is three entries. So the minimum here, so is three, so he's matching. So in, in Vanderveen's uh, critique, where he came to the conclusion that this is just chance, he only gives one entry in terms of uh, Obinga's comparisons. But when you go to Obinga's actual work, you see that this is part of a series. So we have the jet, cobra. And in Bochi Bantu, the generic word for snake is Enzo. Then we have this word here, jaded, speak, tell. And then we have itzo, to say, to recount while boasting, to brag. And notice that uh, you can also say uh, the jet for, for speak or speech in, in Egyptian. So this D here is either a, a half reduplication or this is a suffix. And so it's consistent. And then you have this entry here, uh, 
species of bread, which is in Coptic, J, dish for food, but he has idza to eat. Now, this would seem like, well, the meanings really don't match much. That is not the case. There's what we call semantic slippage in linguistics. And so to support this entry, you would also have to show that this correlation exists in other words, like in one in one form, it has it, it represents food, but in another form, it represents to eat. And, and we'll show that a little later. So this is justified. And, and I put my own notes here, said I would have added in the entry, uh, which means to eat something or to take care of something. It's an uh, a idiophone, right? So, so from, from Obinga's text, we know that this is incorrect. So uh, Vanderveen lied. And so this is why it's important to always critique the critique. You never just take someone's critique and without going back and, and verifying the critique. And so the next entry, let me see. Oh, so this was my critique in, uh, in Aluja volume two. And so I state that Vanderveen presents one word with the initial J sound, the second word with the initial R, and the Coptic word with initial B. These are not representative examples. And so he 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 uh he gives the proto bantu yoka, which in the BLR3 database is joka, snake intestinal worm, with Middle Egyptian jet. But with uh excuse me, I said that I would comp I would not compare proto bantu yoka with Middle Egyptian jet but with Nyek, snake, serpent, which is found in Faulkner 121, Budge 345B. And so we have in the living language, Chiluba in Yoka, serpent. But see, if I would have just left it there, that would have been chance similarity, but that's not the case. So I said, you know, in addition to support this, let's look at another word that has the same form. So Middle Egyptian, Nyek to punish, to be punished. And then we find here in Chiluba, in Yoka, to chastise, to punish, to hate. And then there's another entry here, Nyuk, evildoer, which I think is connected to here. And I, and I have in a footnote where I say that we probably can reinterpret this word Nyuk as evildoer in, in terms of our modern term, a hater, because of the Chiluba Bantu information. So you you must you must be able to not only go back and review because when you're making when when an author is making a critique against another author, you have to first make sure that they are citing the author correctly. And as we can see, Vander Vanderveen is not citing the author correctly, right? Because when we go into the actual text of Obinga, we see systematic sound correspondences. And then there are other words throughout the text with this same initial uh, consonant that still corresponds to these this z sound that I have highlighted in red here in, in Bochi. So Binga's no fool. But for some reason, the author Vanderveen thinks that we are, that we wouldn't follow up, like we wouldn't read his text. Because African scholars, we read everybody. But, but racist European scholars, they don't like to really read our works. They like to categorize our work without engaging it critically. excuse me, taking a sip of some wine in the form of green tea. Anyway. 
so <laughs> so now we we go to the the second line here the word for name and so he gives dina ron ren and but he says but proto bantu yina with d being a noun prefix and i and i go i deal with uh another entry here because we got to understand that when when um obinga in his on his page is making the arguments he's trying to make an argument for the presence and the matching of each sound uh and that you find in egyptian that it corresponds and maps to one or more sounds in the mbochi and so we see here a regular correspondence here uh starting on page 211 with the r sound and so what he shows here is that systematically the R in the initial position corresponds to S in Mbochi. He shows other forms with R as well, but it primarily goes to S. And so we see Ra, Sun, and, and that's my uh, addition here. That's why it says AI for Asarm Hotep. Also, day and time. So this word Ra means sun, day, and time. And so in Mbochi, it is muese, or muese, heat of the sun, day and sun. Rim, fish, su, sway, fish. And then he gives another note, a weakening then, weakening, and then the disappearance of the intervocalic M. And so he goes through the process here and he shows in another language, topoke, uh, gets sway, fish, right? And then rim to cry. And then he gives Isami mockery that makes someone cry. And Kikongo is Kusami, nah, to make mockery of, to make fun of. Right. And I think this is the weaker of the three, but it's 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 justifiable if we consider semantic slippage. Right. And so what I do is I show in a, in a sister language uh, of the Congo, you know, Chiluba Bantu. And I'm like, we can show, I can show easily when it comes to the RN sequence that it is regular the, in the, the correspondence. So you can see here, I'm comparing uh, Egyptian, which I call Chikam, and Chiluba Bantu. And so you see on the left-hand side, the first one is Ren, name. Then you have in Chiluba Bantu, Dina, name, name, right? Or Dina, name. But notice that just as, just as Vander uh, Veen notes, that the D, when you do D in front, that there's a missing consonant, right? If, if we're comparing it to the ancient Egyptian, the Yina is the 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 reconstructed form but if you have d or li in front of it nine times out of ten the y has been dropped which is really just a palatalization of the original r sound right so this is made evident in chiluba bantu because it's disappeared so this is why i made sure that the two consonants that i'm comparing in egyptian are colored differently. So the first, the R sound in Egyptian is red, and then the N sound, as in Nancy, is blue. So you notice there's no red on the Chibantu, uh, Chiluba Bantu side. That's because the, the sound disappeared for these entries. But you notice that the disappearance is not, I have one here that has red, and then another one here is just blue. And then the other one has red and blue. And then the other one just has the blue. It's systematic. So it's systematically lost, just like it is lost in this form in, uh, in Bochi. So I'm reaffirming Obinga's argument. And so we have name, the inner name. Ren, young one, Anna, young. Ren in to rejoice, to praise, Anna. Commend, praise, celebrate, exalt. 
Anyina, admire, wonder at, speak with admiration. Renin, to rejoice, to praise again. And then we have Anya, embrace, hug, kiss, securely uh, to fasten. And actually, um, it should be to embrace. Uh, I've typed this in wrong uh, here. But um, it's, still the, it's still within the same... Uh, the same uh, semantic universe. So as we can see here, the minimum is three entries. It is regular. Everything is accounted for. And so the, 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 the Chiluba backs up the Mbochi and reaffirms. So notice that this, this stuff is not in Obinga's books. So what I'm trying to show here is that I have the competence to to make the argument independent of any one of these scholars using using a language that i'm more familiar with and so we see the sound correspondence is at the bottom r disappears and but the n remain in both languages right so so now we go to the last one which is the uh ibia Bye bye uh, for for a uh, palm tree, but he says in Proto Bantu is Bita, and again we gotta re we gotta repeat his his no, no regular correspondence of chance similarities, and it's just disingenuous. Why? Because when you go to Obinga's work, he's showing you regular correspondences, and so what what um, Obinga is trying to show here is that the B sound as in boy is present uh, and corresponds to B, uh, excuse me, the B as in boy in Egyptian corresponds to the B as in boy in, 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 in Bochi. And so when you go to pages 187, 188, the entry for by palm, which he doesn't even include here, so this isn't this isn't the Coptic form. This is the ancient Egyptian form that I'm showing here on this first row. So he's not only he he's missing information. He just misrepresents the information and doesn't even put the proper entry in. And so so we see here that this B corresponds to this B. There's a disappearance or a becoming of a vowel of this pharyngeal fricative that is uh, behind the B in ancient Egyptian, right? And so we had this word, boo, place, place, region. I don't know why I have that there twice. Um, but in um, in Bochi, when we put id here, it just means the same. So all the, the, the same definitions that you find in Egyptian is the same word as ebe. Ba, soul, spirit. And I put in, um, so that you see here, AI, this is my notes. I, I, I would have put here the, uh, the heart, mind, understanding, intelligence, will, desire, mood, wish. And so he puts here, ba, to be full, integrated, to have one's minds. And, and, and I say that this is, this one is a little hard to justify, but it's not really. Because in, in the African languages, the word for uh, some words for spirit are really words for the mind, but the words for the mind are really words for essential parts of the body, usually the liver, the heart, the stomach, or the lungs. And so it is used metaphorically. So these, these words for these body parts stand metaphorically for that which is essential to one's being, your core. Like when we say, when, when you go to work out at the gym, they say to work out your core, your core being your what's, what's inside your, your, your stomach and, of course, your respiratory system, all that is the core, the center of your body. So that becomes the metaphor for spirit. Spirit is the core, the essential part of you. Uh, just in the same way that your heart or your lungs or your liver is a part of you and keeps you alive. And you know that in these African languages, the word for heart 
or liver is also the word for mind or spirit because the mind is the essential part of oneself. They're, they're all integrated. They're all the same. So you would have to know this about African languages. And this is something that Obinga does not really elaborate on. It, you just kind of have to know this. And so um, it is justified, this correspondence here. Uh, it's just, but you have to have some background information on, on that. So now we go to, you know, Binyet, evil, bad, Ibina, infirmity, defect, a physical or moral, and Binet harp. And then he says, Ibina to dance. Now, I don't think this is a, uh, a, a good correspondence because you're talking about an instrument and then you're talking about the process to dance, which he has as, you know, a harp. So what he's, what he's banking on is the correspondence between the word for harp and its association with playing music. And then, of course, if you're playing music, you know, uh, you should be dancing, at least in an African context. And and I think that is too much of a stretch. He, he should have shown um, a different form. That's why I said I would choose Iber to dance. It, are, it still starts with B. And we should know that in Egyptian, this nasalizer vular trill interchanges with N. And so if he would have put this entry, I think it would be more justified in this one. So I don't I don't think this last one is a very good entry. But if if we were to put this entry that I have in here, then it's justified. In in my opinion. So but regardless, he he gives five entries. And if we discount the, the last one, but if we put in minds, then it, it's a full five. And but it's systematic sound meaning correspondences. And so when when Vanderveen says, you know, that there's no regular, he's lying. He just straight up lied to the public. And because most of those people would not go back in and investigate themselves, they would just take this information and be like, see. See what Vanderveen said? That these Negroes don't know what they're talking about. And this is far from the case. And so uh, my, my response to him is to, you know, what I show here. And that, you know, this discourse, this like this, this word is all over Central and West Africa. Then I give some other ones in the footnote uh, here, which you can pause and, and and see later. But it's it's very disingenuous, and this is this is exactly what I mean. You have to learn how to critique the critique. You you never take anyone's critique and just try to use that in an argument without validating. And so it requires you to be competent in the subject matter to be able to go back and verify the critique, right? So now, our second uh, scholar. And so this is Dr. Russell Skoo. And he mainly deals, he's also a linguist, and he mainly deals with the Chadic languages. And, um, he relatively recently passed away, I believe. So he, he's no longer uh, with us. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, it is I'm, I'm surprised at this critique because, you know, he's, 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 a, he's a very good linguist. So let's, let's not get this confused, you know. But, you know, he, he was stepping out of his lane when he was trying to critique uh, Diop. And, and so the, the title of the article that he uses, uh, that he uh, authored is titled, The Use and Misuse of Language in the Study of African History. Now, there are some aspects of his critique of Dr. Theophilo Binga, excuse me, not Theophilo Binga, of Shekhan Tijope that 
uh, I think is valid. And I have these same critiques against Sheikh Anti Joe. So I am not arguing that his entire article is, is null and void. But there are aspects of his critique that that makes you question his knowledge of the 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 field in terms of the comparison between um Wolof and other languages and, and ancient Egyptian languages, right? And so we'll we'll just get into it. So this is the text that uh Dr. School is is trying to uh argue against and this is the uh genetic relationship of pharaonic egyptian and uh black african languages i'm translating uh from the title here so this was published in 1977 it's a very hard book to get and if anybody just want to gift me this book because you love me uh you know i'll be uh very appreciative anyway uh so and of course this is the late Dr. Shekhan Tiji uh or Joe on the side on the right hand side. So in the 2007 work Dr. School says that he is of the opinion that Diop does not provide any convincing evidence for an Egyptian Wolof connection. And so we have to be we have to be careful of the the language that we use when we're doing critiques because when you make an absolute statement like this all we have to do is provide one or a few examples to the contrary and that will nullify your conclusion so he could have said um in his opinion that Diop does not provide many convincing uh, correspondences to justify an Egyptian Wolof connection. And then he would have to justify or give a number of what many means. But he says, does not provide any. So that means not one. Not one. And then that's where he messed up. And then we're going to show that he doesn't know, or at least didn't know at the time, much about Egyptian. And 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 then, of course, certain aspects of comparative linguistics in regards to semantics. So, in his he's, he states at the beginning, the conclusion will be that Diop presents virtually no lexical resemblances between Egyptian and Wolof of the type that can be found between languages that are generally accepted as being genetically related, right? So on page 50, he gives this example. So, so um, let me explain it this way. So at the top is the Egyptian forms, and then at the bottom is the Wolof form that Diop is comparing. So this is Diop's entry. So you see here the words Sanim, Sanimu, consume and provisions, and then Sanim, gluttony. Right? Now, he compares it to Wolof, Nam, food. Now, it's, you can tell that uh professor school does is not really familiar with the ancient egyptian language and this is after examining this you can tell that um i know for a fact that he's not uh he, he's not competent in egyptian to make comparisons and he's all over the place and so he doesn't know that nm is the root and the s is a prefix and that the W is a suffix in this form above. So, so my commentary to, to uh, 
Professor Sku is that the root of Egyptian sinem, consume and provisions, is nem, produce of the fields as offerings, with reflexes such as wenem, to eat, wenem, food, appetite. And I'm giving this, so you see these entries here, these are the sources that you can find these entries. So in the Warter Bush, in the medical Warter Bush, um, you know, the Ptolematic lexicon, these are all source materials. These are all dictionaries, right? Meeks, you know, uh, AL70, you know, and the page numbers and the section entry on the page. So that's what that is for those of you who are not familiar. So I've highlighted the roots in red and all the entries here. So when them food, appetite, when them fattened ox, Enim, skin of an animal. So the, a variation of this becomes skin of an animal. And I'll explain that in a minute. So Wenemu, devourer. So if you, if you look at this form here, to consume uh, consume uh, provisions. Sinem, Sinemu. This S here is causative, so cause to consume. The variant of that is this word here, Wenemu, Wenemwa, or Wanemwa. Devourer, because this this W here is a first person masculine suffix, right? So I say reflexes of this root can be found in collagen is nim eat slowly, in chiluba bantu bukuwanyama, bukuwanyama, all animals, wildlife, in yama animal beast meat, sango nyama meat, zande nya animal. Hasa nama meat. We can see that the Egyptian forms consist of a root nim uh, with a number of different affixes. It's clear here that school is not familiar of how words are formed in Egyptian. So this root here ultimately means meat or cattle. And then these various different suffixes and prefixes give variation on the word. So this is how the word for um for uh food becomes the word for eat so that's why when we go back to um obinga's remember here where it has the word for ja species of bread Coptic j a dish for food and it corresponds with idza to eat and I said that this is justified because we can justify that semantics in Egyptian with other words. So the same word when them to eat is the same word for when them food and appetite. Because in the in the ancient days, there was there was little distinction between um, the word for uh, the the food and the process of eating, but more than likely what happens is, is there was a loss. So that this is what we see in Egyptian. There's a loss of a grammatical feature that nominalized a verb meaning to eat. Or this is just the, the, the root here. Again, it's, it's a word for meat and food. So this is actually the root that you find in, um, in Wolof. But you see these other variations in Egyptian that have these different various prefixes. So note that this is not, all of this is not in Diop's work. This is not in Skew's work. This is me being able to justify and verify the entry in Diop's work. So remember what I say, you have to have the competence to be able to verify or falsify, regardless on what position that you fall on, you have to have a certain level of competency to critique the critique. So when I come back and I do my analysis, I, I have to side with uh, to Diop on this point. So now we go to the next entry. This one isn't so obvious. So we have uh, Diop. This is page 51 on um, Russell's uh excuse me, Russell Skew's uh, page, but the the entries here are from uh, Diop, you know, uh, 1977. 
So Diop compares the Egyptian word habeset spouse, habesu spouse. But then Skew says neither form is in Faulkner. Faulkner is a dictionary. And I'm, it's, I, I wonder why you even put that there because that's irrelevant because these forms are found in other dictionaries. So this also further lets us know that he does not know. He doesn't even have access to other dictionaries that have variations of these forms. So uh, Diop compares these forms here, the word for spouse, with, with seat, which is this, this last part here for spouse, for new bride, or salt for new bride, and then this fuller form, habasu, or habaswa, is spouse. And then here in French, toilet intim, uh, doing film or uh, personal dressing or clothing of a woman wife. And then Sku again puts in not in dictionaries used by Sku. So this is a form of a word that because he didn't, he couldn't find it in the dictionaries that he had on Wolof that, you know, he's, he's suspecting that this isn't a real word in Wolof. Not understanding the different dialects, countries, you know, most Wolof dictionaries are entries from like more modern urban places, but rarely do they go out into, uh, especially in the early days in the country and interview the the elders uh, who, who speak an older form of Wolof, right? So, so how does this word for spouse become the word for um, personal dressing or clothing of a woman or wife uh, or intimate. So it's, 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 the, it's the kind of clothing that covers a woman's vaginal area and her breast, right? So that's that's what this is. So how do, how do we get there? So now this, this again shows Sku's lack of knowledge of the ancient Egyptian language. And so what I what I was able to demonstrate here, and I'll just read it, that although school says that Habesiet and Habesu are not in Faulkner, that would be irrelevant since the word is in the Waterbush, and that's the Ermin and Grandpa famous Waterbush. For example, Habesiet, wife, concubine. And I give the entry here. We also have the entry Habesu, clothing. Call uh, clothing and clothes. So now you can see the correspondence. So um, Sku is not even adding all the entries. So when you see this form here, personal dressing clothing of a woman, a wife, it corresponds to this form here, habesu clothing clothes, and a variance a variant of this word meaning spouse. How does all this come together? It's clear that paronymy is at play here. What we have is a semantic shift that stems from a root, biz, meaning secret or hidden or hide, which gives way to habes, to clothe, to cover. Habes, veiled one, a priest or a priestess. So you see how words are built? This Z, this, this, this voice fricative here is... Um, becomes devoiced in the form of S. So you see that this root, the BZ or BS root, is prefixed by the dotted H. And when this word for secret or hidden is prefixed with this dotted H form, then it becomes a word for to clothe or to cover, or the veiled one, which is a priest or priestess. The connection lies by analogy in the nature of what a concubine is in a harem. The Turkish word harem, part of a Middle Eastern house reserved for women, comes from the Arabic haram, wives and concubines, but originally women's quarters, literally something forbidden or kept safe from a root harama. He guarded or forbade. So when you when you uh, see the name or hear the name Boko Haram, 
that that word is, that word haram is used to mean prohibited forbidden and the word boko is a mispronunciation of the english word book so that they're, they're they're talking about uh and more so they're referring to western books so they're saying that is pro the the prohibition as a prohibition is forbidden to learn about western ways so they're 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 the name boko haram is essentially an anti western uh ideology education all of that and so that's this this is a terrorist group that lives uh that primarily reigns in northern uh nigeria right uh, uh muslims so that same root here you notice that this word meaning to, um uh he guarded or forbade or something forbidden or kept safe in another form means wives and concubines it's the same thing that you see here and i could argue that this word is actually egyptian by way of metathesis but that i'll save that for another argument that this word haram is actually egyptian and 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 but we can see the process here and there's there's metathesis on the last two consonants and so the the s became intervocally and weakened and, and was rotarized and b became m but that's a that's another conversation so the same dotted hrm root gives us the reflex haruma to be prohibited forbidden to become sacred the haram is the part of the household the harem is part of the household that is so sacred to the man of the house that male visitors are forbidden to go there and so a reflex of that habes is a word lid meaning to cover so when you when you understand that the that the word derives from a uh, a root meaning secret or hidden and then the the reflexes means to cover and then to clothe one's private parts or uh and that which is kept sacred a woman's so then you understand how the form means um wife or concubine that which that who is uh 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 helped held sacred that who was forbidden from 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 others so you you kind of get the mental so you 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 have to know these things about culture and you have to know the linguistics to justify this to to make these types of critiques so this is what i mean when you are the person who's evaluating two arguments from two separate folks you have to be competent enough to evaluate objectively the arguments being made by both people and and as part of the research process you have to independently verify all claims and so i make it a point that as much as possible if i'm using anyone's citation to support an argument I have independently justified my usage of their um their their uh citation, right? Their initial argument that I'm using to support mine. So we're we're talking about how to do scholarship here. And so I uh, continue, I say, in other words, it is kept separate and secret. It gives way to the notion that what is sacred is kept secret, hidden from the masses. Therefore, the profane. This is how the root in Chikam Biz, secret mystery, became Habis to cover, to clothe, Habis Yit, wife, concubine. The Wolof term Habasu, spouse, and personal dressing clothing of a woman, wife, or intimate dressing of a, um, uh, a clothing of a woman, wife, begins to make sense in light of this semantics. The dressing clothing spoken of in Wolof is that which covers a woman's vagina her intimate secret part this term can also refer to the washing or cleaning of this area as well thus a spouse wife is someone who is sacred whose intimate parts are kept secret from others it is only the husband who has access to this hidden secret part of her and so knowing the culture which you you would uh, skew is never going to out culture check on to diop who was born and raised in the tradition into the culture and who also studied linguistics 
and was a physicist. So he was no dummy. So we continue. He says on page 52, he's comparing Diop's comparison of the word Eken, cup, Ikenu, ho, with Khan, hole, or Gin, mortar. Now, he again, remember that the entries that I'm showing here are some of the entries that Sku says that that uh, Diop, that these do not show uh, correspondences. And I'm like, this is, where, where are you getting this from, Dr. Sku? So let's continue. We must keep in mind the following entry. Ikin to ho to scoop out to hack. To confirm Diop's comparison, we note the following in Chikam. Ikin it ho, hollow, a demon's habitation. So we have the word in Egyptian, ikinit, whole, hollow. So when we see this word in Wolof, khan, whole, it is the same word. They just lost the grammatical features that once um, that that this language once had in comparison with Egyptian. So we see these forms, ikin, cup, ikinu, ho, because these are derivative forms of this word here, ikin to ho, to scoop out, to hack. And so a cup or a ho is that which uh, scoops out or hacks. That's what that is. So it is clear that the words ikinu ho and ikin cup derive from the verb ikin uh, or yekin to scoop out to ho, to hack. This act leaves a hole in the ground. The semantic shift in Wolof to gin Mortar, which is a cup-shaped receptacle made of a hard material in which ingredients are crushed or ground, used especially in cooking the pharmacy, is reasonable. The word ikinu ho derives from ikin to hack. The W suffix in this case is an instrument of suffix. The T in ikinit is a suffix of abstraction. The Wolof language lost many of these grammatical features inherent from chin into over time. And so I also put in a footnote, this corresponds, we're talking about this, this word uh, here on the first line, yakin, to hold, to scoop out, to hack, with the Wolof word, uh, yakan, to hold, scoop out, to serve, out of. And, and, uh, and I give a shout out to Brother uh, Aziz Fall, also the Mosi Warrior Clan native Wolof speaker, um, for that entry there. So we, we see here, that you know he doesn't have any grounds to stand on and so uh lastly so okay so this one is a little different right so what a uh, school attempts to do in in these entries is okay so he he went through a list of entries of, of Wolof in Egyptian given by Dr. Shekhan to Diop. So now he's he's going to attempt to school Diop on how historical comparative linguistics is done. So in his attempt to school Diop, what he does is he, he gives an ancient Egyptian entry for a word and then he goes and looks at a word in a number of Chadic languages. Because remember what I said, and for those who follow the Afro-Asiatic hypothesis, the languages that are included in that superphylum are, for example, ancient Egyptian as a standalone, and then you have Omotic, and then you have Cushitic, and then you have Semitic, then you have Berber, and then you have Chadic languages. So he's, you remember, you know, so he's, that's all he works on is Chadic languages. So, so he's going to show Diop how to do it, right? And so he gives an entry on page 70 for this, this word in Egyptian, T for bread. Also uh, the entry to eat. So this is another correspondence that justifies the, what we saw in the, in the form given by um, Obinga for that for that entry jahi meaning um bread and then the corresponding form idzo 
in embochi meaning to eat. So we see here that that same semantics exists within Egyptian for another word, and that's T meaning bread and also T meaning to eat. So it justified here. So what he does is he goes into a Wolof dictionary and he finds these two words, meaning one meaning food and the other one meaning to eat. And so he says, you see that these are totally different than the word tea, meaning bread and um, to eat. So he says the 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 uh, what best corresponds to this entry for Egyptian is, you know, Ingazim, which is a Chadic language, ta and hasa, chi, meaning to eat. But my question is, why would you compare these Wolof forms to this random entry, uh, tea, bread, and to eat? Why didn't you compare the Wolof forms, this lak, to eat, and nam, food, to kik, to eat, in Egyptian, and ik, a food? And why didn't you compare the word nam food to winam to eat? Winam food and appetite. You see how disingenuous he is? So he's just all over the place trying to make an argument. But you have, and, and I've and I've heard people try to use skew against Diop and try to make it seem like African scholars are incompetent. And and the and the people who are doing the critiques just be wrong is all wrong can be. And so on that same page, I state that one wonders why school would compare Egyptian sini, which means to resemble, with uh with ingazim zigal. Uh, I mean that's a, a dialect of it, meaning to know, and hasa sani meaning to know. With Wolof Ham. So he, he's trying to do like with the, in the other ones. So he he randomly picks an Egyptian word and then he finds some alleged correspondences in Chadic languages. And then he finds a word in Egyptian, I mean, excuse me, in Wolof that doesn't resemble any of the forms that he provides. And then I ask, well, why, if you're going to compare the word in Wolof, Scam or Ham, I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, Brother Aziz. You, you're going to have to help me out here because I don't know if it's like an X or XAM. Was it like CUM? But, you know, so any will off speakers, I do apologize for butchering your language. So bear with me today because we going in. Anyway, so why didn't he compare? So I say, why didn't he compare Egyptian HAM to know, to come to know with the will off form? Ham meaning to know. And I said, you can justify this comparison. So for cross-reference, see Egyptian Hamet, clouds, with Wolof, Khzin, cloud. Egyptian Har, a pebble, with Wolof, Kir, a stone. You see the entries that I have in red? So we see that this, this pharyngeal fricative here corresponds to the X in the initial position in Wolof. So you see how easily I was able to justify that by just doing the work? So I falsified um, school's entries, these past two entries here. And so this is, this is what I mean. And so you, 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 you have to be weary of people in the conscious community who are always trying to vilify African scholars and make it seem like these African scholars are on the fringe of scholarship and that they are incompetent. These African scholars are degreed out the ass at the top universities in the world. And when they're making these arguments, they're not making half-assed arguments in terms of these relationships, in terms of these 
correspondences and 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 artifacts and things that we find in comparison to the ancient Egyptian and these other African, these modern African cultures and languages. And it is about time we start putting some respect on these African scholars' names. And so I just wanted to highlight some that, especially in the ancient Egyptian and, and Nubian uh, research who do a lot of comparisons with, with modern uh, African societies, you know, of course, we have Dr. Theo Falabinga. That's a given. And so uh, it's interesting. You know, so, yeah, so <clears throat> it's, it's, it's interesting that Okay, so in this text here, and actually earlier from the, from the 60s and 70s, Dr. Theofalo Binga has been arguing that, the, that you cannot justify the Semitic, the, I mean, the, the relationship between the Semitic language and the ancient Egyptian language. Everybody in their mama, you know, who never examined the work, never did the work, tried to vilify Obinga and any other African researcher who made that claim. They would just try to ignore him. They would try to belittle and, and mischaracterize the arguments and things from Obinga. Right? And shout out to Brother Unk, who some time ago uh, hit me up to this. So this is, this is something that Unk found and gave to me now don't listen to uncle on anything dealing with astrophysics he is out of his lane and he's crazy and psycho but shout out to brother unk for uh sending me this entry love you brother just like messing shots 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 thrown shots anyway there was a conference in 2018 it was actually two conferences one in 2018 and one in 2019. And the one in 2018 was held here in Texas at the University of, uh, of Texas in Austin. Then there was another one uh, at, uh, at Brown University on the East Coast, right? And the whole conference was centered around whether the uh egyptian language one should be classified in afroasiatic and two whether it or, or its position in Af they haven't given up afroasiatic but what is the true position of egyptian and afroasiatic and then two um is it related to semitic and so one of the 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 entries for the for the conference was this professor here of linguistics dr aaron wilson wright and keep in mind the nature of the entire conference they have a whole conference questioning the relationship between semitic and egyptian and so the title of his paper and his chapter because there's a book coming out um on the uh, from the from the conference so I, I, I got correspondence from the people from the conference and they said that it should come out at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. So sometime in December or January, December of this year or January of 2023, that the text will come out. But the title of his presentation is Rethinking the Relationship Between Egyptian and Semitic, the Morphological, Lexical and Phonological Evidence, right? This is from his abstract. Although Egyptologists and Semeticists alike agree that Egyptian and Semitic are genetically related based on morphological evidence, they have yet to establish systematic sound correspondences between the two languages, two language families. The lack of correspondences in turn raises doubts about the relationship between Egyptian and Semitic and necessitates a renewed analysis of their shared features. In this talk, I will review the morphological, lexical, and phonological evidence for a genetic relationship between Semitic 
and Egyptian by comparing Proto-Semitic and internally reconstructed Egyptian forms, a standard historical linguistic procedure that has helped establish numerous language families ranging from Indo-European to Uto-Azteca. And look what I have highlighted in the red. Based on this comparison, meaning the historical comparative method, which requires regular and systematic sound correspondences uh, between basic vocabulary, um, of course, the phonemes and uh, morphology. So based on this comparison, I argue that there is insufficient evidence to support a genetic relationship between Egyptian and Semitic. This is not to say that the two language families are not genetically related only that it is impossible to detect a genetic relationship between them using current methodology. So you, you, you hear this. So they have a whole conference on this subject. You know who they didn't invite? They didn't invite Dr. Theophilo Binga. They know about Dr. Theophilo Binga because you have people trying to throw shots at Theophilo Binga in his argument so now y'all have a conference and y'all come to the same conclusion as dr theo follow binga but now you don't want to invite him he he can't submit a paper on this he been since the 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 70s making this argument and so this is what they do african scholars come into the mix change up the game Make the make the criteria for arguments more uh, stringent, more rigorous. And then they ignore and belittle the African scholars. But then they will come and use our ideas and act like they they discovered this on their own. And this is just the natural evolution of the field. And then don't credit these African scholars. For these changes. And this is why we have to be vigilant in, in checking and correcting those who, who, who want to dismiss and want to want to throw uh, language like black ology when, when these African scholars are making these claims and not making them randomly. It's based on science, scientific methods, correct methods, tep haseb. And so now you you got the the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of New York on the African origin of civilization, giving a whole uh, dedication to Shekhan to Diop and coming to their senses that um, there is a correlation between uh, African societies and ancient Egyptian that we have to recognize. Who was making those arguments? Those African scholars, Shekanta Diop, Obinga, and others. When you go to the website, it says, Scholars today recognize Africa as the source of our common ancestry. But in 1974, Senegalese scholar and humanist Shekanta Diop shocked and challenged historians by asserting the influence of ancient African civilizations in this groundbreaking book, The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. This exhibition pays homage to Diop by presenting masterpieces from the museum's collections from West and Central Africa alongside the art from ancient Egypt for the first time in Met's history. And so like this is this is major because when they try to do African art, they never put Egyptian with it. They always they always put the Egyptian art and everything with Near East Semitic folks. In, in Europeans, they put it in those collections. They never put it in with the African art. So it's hard for you to see the connections close by because they separate them and, and, and don't put them together so that people can make these, these uh, correlations. Through 21 pairings of works from different African cultures and eras, this exhibition provides a rare opportunity to appreciate the extraordinary creativity of the continent across five millennia, revealing unexpected parallels and contrast. 
Remember, when we when we make these arguments, we do in blackology. We just try to make everything by there's no connections, there's no correspondences. But they change their mind when Europeans validate certain things. So when African scholars make these claims and things, we 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 just talking out of the side of our ass. But until you find some European to validate these claims, you won't be on board. That's because you are incompetent. You are not competent in the fields of study to evaluate the evidence on their own. And this is the problem that we are having in this community. A bunch of incompetent people trying to comment on issues that require deep and rigorous study. And when they get put into a corner, they want to go and find these random Europeans to try to counter African scholarship, and they are not competent enough to even evaluate their critique. And they be just throwing folks at us at random who are just uh, Rudy Poos and half asses when it comes to the scholarship, don't have the training that these African scholars do. And it's a shame. And so, you know, when scholars like Dr. Serge Sonaran in his text, The Priest of Ancient Egypt, when he says, but for Egypt, the sea marks the limit of a world, of an African world. Thus, the dreams of Ogo Tumeli or the Bantu philosophy carries precious elements which help us to understand better certain aspects of Egyptian religious thought. But we must expect, we must expect to find little of Platonic thought in this world. Page four of the French version, page seven in the English. This is 1957 that this prominent Egyptologist recognized that there is commonalities between Dogon thought and culture in ancient Egyptian and Bantu thought and culture in ancient Egyptian. And so what he's implying here is that if you want to understand ancient Egypt, study these folks. This is what Diop comes and says later. which they are now recognized this 2022. And so this is significant because these are Dogon carvings on the right-hand side. So, you know, this is just a homage to, to African scholars. Put some respect on our mother name. And so, of course, we know scholars like Shek Antidote and, of course, Thea Falabenga. But many may not be aware of, you know, other scholars like Dr. Modupe Oduyoye, who's a Yale-educated African uh, linguist and theologian who makes these connections between Yoruba, Semitic language, and ancient Egyptian. Formally trained. Dr. Muba Benge Belolo, one of my mentors who I trained under. Got so many damn degrees and certificates, it's ridiculous. He's where I got the term Chikam from. So I, I borrowed that from him. Out of the Congo, Egyptologist and linguist. He's primarily a philosopher. And so this is one of his books towards a Chikam Coptic and Luba dictionary. He's 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 the inspiration for me uh learning about the Chiluba language and being able to use it in my research. Dr. Ababukri Musalam out of Senegal. This is one of his books here, 
uh, the paths of the Nile or the roads of the Nile, the relations between ancient Egyptian and black Africa. Trained linguists, trained Egyptologists. Dr. Babakar Sal, the Ethiopian roots of ancient Egyptian, preface, uh, prefaced by Dr. Theophilo Benga. A lot of us aren't familiar with these scholars. A lot of us don't read French or German. Dr. Omendigi, Pierre Omendigi, linguist, Egyptologist, anthropologist at the University of Yundi. He will be speaking at the, uh, he's one of the presenters as well at the conference. I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, but I guess I'll mention it now. So uh, the West Africa and beyond, ancient Nubian and Egyptian interconnections with the Niger Valley and the Atlantic world. You can go to westafricabeyond.org. It's going to be February 15th through 16th, February 15th and 16th, uh, of course, of this year. And so he is one of the uh, speakers. And I'm not sure if they got... I know they're trying to get um, Dr. Lam, uh, Abu Bukri Musalam, as well. But there's a number of just just bad scholars, badass scholars. I mean, um, that's that's going to be presenting there. I'll be presenting there as well. Um, so if you want to know more information, go to WestAfricaBeyond.org. But you got to get familiar with Dr. Pierre Omendigi starting the Egyptology department in Cameroon. You have to be familiar with Dr. Alan Anselin. He's another one of my linguistic mentors. He's a linguist and an archeologist and Egyptologist, the founder and creator of the um, Cahir Caribbean journal, right? And, and this this is one of his books, The Question of the Pool or the Fulani, you know, uh, and the history of, of West African, uh, West Africa and Egypt, or Egyptian West Africans. Then we have Dr. Oscar Pofuma, who deals with the Basa people in Congo, excuse me, in Cameroon. And so this is his text, uh, Cultural History of Black Africa. And he looked kind of like Brother Chavez or the Mosley Warrior clan. So this is this is Chavez in the future if he if he cut his locks. So this is this is I'm I'm a bet if he do a test, he come back from Cameroon. Uh anyway, so you gotta be familiar with Dr. Oscar Pafuma. Dr. Kipkowicz Sambu, you know, who, who grew up, you know, hearing about their origins in ancient Egypt, the collagen people. And he went and got a PhD and, and justified those claims. So he did, so you know, uh, almost a lifelong study and provided the, the, the pre-Christian, pre, pre-Islam uh documentation from like when these people first came and they already had these these oral traditions talking about they came from ancient Egypt there was no christianity no islam and these people live in kenya uganda parts of western ethiopia congo on the western part of the congo you have a whole bunch of people who live in Congo who originally come from the Sudan, like your Songo speakers and your Azande folks who live in Congo, but they originate in the Sudan. And then you have people over here uh, questioning, you know, can do, do African people migrate far? Like, are y'all serious? So you have to get familiar with Dr. Kipkowicz Sambu. 
Of course, you got to get familiar with Dr. Shermarka Keita, who's also going to be presenting at the conference. You know, and he's a, uh, a medical doctor, you know, skeletal biology, uh, including paleopathology and biological distance, population origins, and diversity in Egypt and in the Saharo Nilotic region, biological variation in Nile Valley and the rest of Africa, colonization of the Near East by Egypt, history of ideas about race and racial thinking. You need to be familiar with Dr. Shumarka Keita. Of course, you need to be familiar with Jean Claude and Boley. And if you are not new to myself in this channel, you know, you already know who Jean-Claude Mboli is. But just in case for others, you need to know who this linguist is and why his work is very important to this discussion. You need to be familiar with Mbalek Maninge, also out of the Cameroon and of the Basa people. And he documents their oral tradition saying that they come from Egypt. Whether you believe it or not, these are the scholars you have to consult. And there is evidence to believe that they're not lying. But you got to be familiar with these folks. You got to be familiar with this scholarship. You got to be familiar with Dr. Kamani Nahusi out of Guyana. We've had him on the show. We've had um, Dr. Madinge on the show. Of course, we had Dr. Keto on the show. We've had Dr. Kamani Nahusi on the show. He'll be in the documentary film that she's into as well. So read his book on libation, an African ritual of heritage in the circle of life. We got powerful sisters in the movement. You got to read Calling Out to Isis, the enduring Nubian presence at Philae by Dr. Solange Ashby. Egyptologists and Nubiologists. You got to get familiar with Sister Deborah Hurd, who's a PhD candidate in archaeology of Nubia and um, ancient Egypt. So she'll be getting her Egyptology degree and archaeology degree uh, very soon. You got to be familiar with Dr. Riketi Ahmed. Most, most of the people learning Meta Nature is because of Dr. Riketi Ahmed. In, in, in the black community, you learn in Meta Nature, you either learning it through um, Dr. Mario Beatty, who learned under Obinga. You're going to be learning from anybody who studied under Dr. Riketi, Brother Sunjeti. Brother Wu Jawu, all studied under uh, Dr. Riketti. And then those who studied directly with Dr. Jacob Carruthers when he was living. And so the, 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 the Trinity is Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. Riketti Amin, and Dr. Theophilo Bingham. They were the ones who, who started teaching Meta Nature uh, here in the Black community, um, you know, independent of the you know egyptology departments for like for example the university of chicago or or brown university etc you got to put some respect on these scholars name and then of course i'm me so you just gotta you know i'm I'm gonna I'm throw myself in the mix because i just like to start stuff but i have the ability to read to evaluate the work and, and to make these key and critical arguments. That's why I try to introduce y'all to some of these scholars so that y'all can expand your, your palette and, 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 and understand the, the diversity and uh, just the scope and span of this field of, of, of African Egyptology. And I'm, I just named a few folks. There are a lot more that I could have named. So there's a whole body of literature that you have to read and be familiar with before you come into these internet streets making these claims and then trying to use some off-brand 
European scholars to try to discredit the Africans and and haven't evaluated their work. And then we gotta we gotta respond to their piss poor responses to African scholarship. And then, you know, we're being accused of uh of trying to make everything black and we're just on the fringes, et cetera, et cetera. BS. But that is my presentation for now. I thank y'all for joining and I'll end there. So I will look at the comments and see if there are any questions on the like. Oh, wow, 180 comments. So, of course, I'm not going to be able to go through all of that. But let me just scroll up a little bit and see what y'all talking about in my H-Town uh, voice. So <laughs> let me see here. Uh, let me see what even this thing. He said, even this thing at the Met is along the same line that current African scholars are. They corroborating that info with uh, who put it together. Uh, it was all mentioned. I don't know if you saw. It, it, it was all mentioned on the slide. Um, but you could just go to the Met website and they'll tell you all all the details that uh, relevant details uh, that I think answers your question. Let me see. He says they know the wave is coming. He says the barbershop ology folks done did it. Um, <laughs> the bar I don't know what y'all talking about. He said, uh, T Van's going live after the after he watched this. I bet. <laughs> Let me see. He said they shook ones like the doctor might say. <laughs> And in the worldview, they need to corroborate. Uh, he said, in the worldview, they don't need to corroborate. I think they're saying in their worldview, they don't need to corroborate with us. I don't know. Yeah, it looks like y'all having your own independent scholar uh, conversation. And let me see. Sister Ladosha says, we need this scholarship for Afro hair because the white narrative of science doesn't work. That's why I love this channel. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, that's um we we had a a scholar, Dr. Uh Ashton, who's an Egyptologist, who's now she went and got a second PhD uh in I think child psychology. Like she was so fed up with the dysfunction in Egyptology that she just went and got a whole different degree and went to a whole different field. That's crazy. But she she has uh, some work, but primarily just just dealing with Egyptian hair. But um, that would just be a good thing unto itself. I know there's been some other scholars who've addressed the hair, but I haven't really seen like a good, just thorough study. You know, saying of African hair, and you know, at least across the uh, that like there's a book on Egyptian hair. I have that. But, you know, it's uh, it, it's not on the line of, of African scholarship because they're mainly dealing with, of course, the hair of the folks who came in and settled in there, but not with the other folks that, you know, who've been there since time immemorial. He said, registered for the conference yesterday. It should be interesting for sure. Thank you, uh, Brother Brendan Sims. He says, we don't study Greek as well. You know, you have folks trying to say we don't need to study Greek, 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 uh, that ancient Greek information has a lot of good information about Egypt that people are sleeping on. Uh, let me see. I'm calling anyone fighting for Africans in the world, the new world pseudo. <laughs> let me see. He says, thanks for this list of scholars. You appreciate it. He said the collagen called Kemet Misri, the biblical name, uh, big pseudos. Nope, they call they call Kemet. They at the time that they left, it was called Misri, but they call Kemet Emit. That's why you got to read this. Read the scholarship. Um, the list is plenty nice one. Thanks. Uh, let me see exactly. And do they migrate across oceans as well? Silly questions. Duh. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not with the whole old mech conversation. So, like I said, it's it's not that African scholars are above critique. 
And it's not that African scholars don't make mistakes. And but you got to weigh, you can't what what I'm fighting against is this just this automatic dismissal of of conclusions of African scholars because they don't some of the conclusions don't match up with some of the conclusions of European scholars. And so what what they'll do is try to put European scholars as the standard. And if your if your conclusion doesn't match theirs, then you're automatically wrong. They don't they're not competent enough to evaluate the evidence to let the evidence speak for itself. And that's what I'm fighting against here, because not all African scholars have everything right. But so there's there's no scholar. And so, you know, they want to say that, you know, African scholars are not above critique, but they don't critique the people who are critiquing. And that's what the problem is here. Like they don't they don't. They don't have that background to be able to do that. And that's problematic. And so if if you don't see, for example, like the the example that I gave uh, earlier with the Semitic, why why are they just now in 20, what was then 2018, but, you know, fast forward to 2022, why are you just now coming to the realization that you cannot justify the relationship between Semitic and ancient Egyptian in 2022 when we've had African scholars making these arguments since the uh, early 70s. The reason is because there's a power differential because they have the power to just summarily dismiss and not include African scholars in the conversation. That's what made the 1974 UNESCO conference so significant. Now, people misunderstand the conference. They think that Sheikh Anta Diop and Theophilo Binga came in and won the fight. You, 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 you'll see a bunch of uh, people thinking like, yeah, they came in and destroyed. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't do none of that. And not that they didn't do any of that. It's just that conferences are not where scholarship is settled. What Sheikh Antidiop and Theophilo Binga did was put African scholarship on the world stage. They they forced the the uh the institutions, the academy to deal and take seriously African scholars and the and the arguments and conclusions on the same level as you would take any other scholar because beforehand they would just they would just totally ignore you and try everything to keep your arguments out of the conversation why so you 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 know why they dismiss obinga because they're trying to make the arguments that the uh, the semitic speakers um coming out of the levant in asia are the original folks who came and settled and built up and developed ancient egypt well if you are now making the argument that you can't even justify the relationship between ancient egyptian and semitic you can't then make the argument that these semitic speakers coming out of asia came and settled into the levant and created ancient egyptian society because they, you don't go and conquer and, and settle in an area, then you just all of a sudden change your entire language structure and vocabulary and grammar and phoneme in- inventory. That is unheard of. It is impossible. And so Semites are over here. The Egyptians are over here. But when we make those systematic, regular correspondences with Egyptian and Bantu and Egyptian and Wolof and Egyptian and Yoruba, you can't do that with Semitic. So now the conversation has to shift. How does the ancient Egyptian find all these correspondences with these groups over here that allegedly aren't supposed to be related to them? But we can't even establish a systematic relationship and the and the Semites are just around the corner. This is why they were dismissing Diop and dismissing Obinga and trying to try to 
uh, characterize their work instead of engaging it critically. And this is why we must we must have pushback against those who who try to uh, you know summarily dismiss using their 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 Eurocentric mindsets, trying to guise it as you know a, a support and love for black people. They think like Europeans, and they're trying to use European tactics to try to dismiss African scholarship. But you see, slowly but surely, they it's it's so much overwhelming evidence that they can no longer just summarily dismiss these scholars and 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 try to use stuff like fringe scholarship. No, you're on the fringe. You're outside of the evidence. And this is what we got to push back. So remember, there's 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 dialogue in in scholarship. There's dialogue. There's 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 back and forth. But if you just automatically just dismiss something, there's no dialogue and there's no sharing of the information. But the the issue we've been having is is the power differential. They run the universities, they run all the journals, they run all the media, they host and got all the money for the conferences. They got the money for the digs, et cetera, et cetera. And so because of colonialism, slavery, apartheid, and all these you know the the African schools and resources uh, uh, and and institutions don't have the same resources to combat, you know the the narrative or present a narrative that will that will uh, permeate in the same way in which they do. So they know this. So that's why they're able to do what they're doing. But you know African people find a way to to make things happen. And 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 every time they open one of their their classrooms, it's somebody that them read some diop. There's somebody that them read some of Binga or heard something from somebody. Even probably heard some from Sara Sutton Seti, and and just just want to come in and, and challenge. So everywhere they go, they get in this this challenge, this pushback, because African scholars are finding ways to get the information out there, and that's why platforms like this. That's why. You know, uh, supporting the film, the the China Into film, is is very important so that we can get these narratives out. And so, um, so that's why you know these these conversations are important. Let me see. Uh, let's see. And thank you to Sister Ladosha for the super chat. It's greatly appreciative. Um, thank you. And I'm just going down, scrolling. This was great. Thank you. Uh, Peace of Sar. Will you be writing on any other African subjects? As far as I write on a variety of African subjects. Um, I wrote on kingship. I wrote on... Um, Love. Uh, the Aluja series is just a whole host of things. Um, I wrote on trying to create a dictionary. Uh, I'm going to be writing. Um, I'm in the midst of working on uh, a text called African, uh, excuse me, quantum field theory as African heritage. I've been working on this and studying. I had to take some time off to just really just study the the astrophysics the mathematics behind einstein's uh, you know uh field equations in, in in terms of um the like e equals mc squared and all this other kind of stuff which is actually like 15 pages worth of equations that that little e equals mc squared is is it, it fools you um and so there's that text that's coming up there's another text that is, you know, not so much on like, you know, Egyptian connections or anything, but it is it's titled Religious Proselytization as a Form of Violence. And then subtitled The Violation of the um, African Principle of Simultaneous Validity, right? And so, you know, we're going to be dealing with how these kind of mal- destructive ideas become part of the 
uh, Abrahamic religious traditions and then how they permeate in conflict with the with the dominant inner and worldview that you find on the African continent. And so this kind of conflict of minds, so to speak, to use Jordan and Gabbani's phraseology is is rooted in this the uh, the opposition to what, you know, we deem simultaneous validity, which is the kind of the foundational aspect of Kimoyo. So when when I was when I thought of this, you know, uh, associating this concept of Kimoyo to African religions, it was based on my research for this book here, which, you know, I hope to have released in a, um, in, in a couple of years. So there's a there's a variety of different things in which um, I talk about. So in, you know, I'm uh, I have a wide interest, but mainly science, mainly language and and philosophy culture and religion so those those are usually what what i stick to uh in terms of you know research for my books so peace and blessings thank you uh let me see are making the necessary sound correspondence is the only way to strengthen the genetic relationship between semitic and ancient egyptian it is required because you okay so when you're doing scientific research when you when you when you design an experiment you should know that there are automatically going to be a few hypotheses that you have to um falsify right so that the the first hypothesis is that that you know the whatever the experiment or whatever the research question in fact is true that the experiments uh support the the and the observations support the hypothesis. Then you have the null hypothesis that you know there's really no change either or, there's or not enough uh, sufficient information, or there is is just totally false. Like the the experiments do not uh, justify or support the initial hypothesis, and so. And that, and then the really one is that there's just a kind of so with the no hypothesis, if you're if you observe the initial uh, pattern, that it is the result of chance, that it's a coincidence, that that you see what you see, that there's nothing really systematic about it, and that that kind of framework is 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 applied to languages as well. So when we do the historical comparative method, it is designed to eliminate one of the hypotheses, and that is chance. So it is on this grounding of the regular systematic sound correspondences that you're able to determine what sounds in the two languages or more being compared map to each other. So when you see me with those tables and on the very right-hand side, I have these, these just uh, the list of the consonants side by side these are the consonants that map to each other in the respective languages for the entries on the table that you see so that you can see that it is regular it's not chance it's not it's not it's not a coincidence that you see and so that's that's something that uh for example goes against the in the initial you know lookership of the omec heads so when you see the Olmec heads, you'll see, you know, like like I got a good old school African nose, a, a big thick African nose. So you'll see African nose. I got good big thick thick African, you know, West African lips, right? And you'll see that on the Olmec heads. So at first glance, it'll look like, well, these are some African people, but you got to look at the people who were there, who are living there. And so the the Olmec at the time of the Olmec, the the human beings did not change drastically. That it would be just a totally different people, unless there was some history to justify that the original folks were moved out or you know died out, and in a new different phenotypically uh, diverse population came and and settled you know in the first place in in that area. But there's a phenomenon in biology called convergence, and that is there there are features in organisms that appear to be the same because they have evolved independently 
in similar environments. They had the same type of evolutionary pressures that that uh, that provide the environment and the molding for the type of phenotypic uh, or morphological features that you see in these types of organisms. So the 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 feature of like darker skin or you know the wide noses and lips these are features of the tropical zone and so by convergence you see these same features amongst these 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 people in mexico uh, of that area so you know i grew up mainly you know as a teen here in um texas so you know you remember that texas used to be mexico we see real Mexicans, not, you know, Spaniard Mexicans, like real indigenous Mexicans. And they look just like the Olmec heads. No, no, nothing different, nothing whatsoever. So they have thicker than normal or, or quote unquote, at least bigger than white folks lips and these noses and the certain shapes. They look the same. So for somebody who lives in the area who grew up in the area, who grew up with the people whose ancestors were the Omex, it's not surprising I see them. They're not, they're not black. It's not a result of them intermixing or some West African folks came there. That's that's not what happened. And so when you're doing the when you're doing your initial research, you always have to have to account for coincidence. What are what in your research methodology eliminates coincidence? And so that's why the systematic uh, sound meaning correspondences are required in trying to establish the genetic relationship. That's your first, that's your foundational step. So that's why, you know, uh, researchers like Mboli, you know, Binga and, and others like myself have looked at the arguments of Greenberg and shown that these are invalid language categorical constructs because they haven't done the prerequisite work to eliminate chance as a reason for these these words that uh, appear to be similar because when you're doing genetic uh uh research in terms of languages there there may be forms of words that don't look nothing like the form in the language in language a so if, if we're talking about language b and language a that these do not look at all alike. You would skip over them if you were just looking, if you were doing lookership. But when we when we put them side by side in a table and we have like 10, 20 entries, we see that they have the same patterns, that there's a logical equivalence between the two um, paired sets. And then that's how we know that we can eliminate chance, that these are not, these are not correspondent by chance. The only way that you can argue for these patterns is because of a shared relationship from um, a parent language from which these two languages, language A and B, both descend. And so it's, it's very important to understand methodology in, in uh, just any field, period. You know, you got to understand the methods. And so this is how you know another person is serious, like go into people's libraries, especially those who like to, to critique everybody. Look at all the, the books that they have. They'll probably have some good books. But compare that to how many books that they have on research methods for the different fields for which those books are, you know, the, the latest in information of that field. You have to, you have to buy books on research methods, and then you have to go through the exercise and train in them. Then and only then will you understand the arguments that are being made in the books. So I buy research methods books in the same way that I would just buy a regular book from about any other subject, because I know that is that is just as important in 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 the process of evaluating. Uh, uh scholarship in the field so if, if i'm trying to critique something in archaeology i need to have like six or seven books on archaeological research methods on dating how they do it what labs they go to 
how much of this substance you need to put in here what's the ratio of this because all of that becomes important you know like dr kato gave me some books on on like skeletal and how to evaluate i'm looking at all of the the different forms how what's the notes that that are required and all of this so when i'm making anthropological arguments i know from from the standard research the 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 established methods in the field but i also try to understand how the methods became the standard in the first place you have to look at the past scholarship to see you know as as the field began to mature why certain methods fell off and why certain ones remain because of the types of results that they were getting so that's just as important then you also have to get works on the philosophy of science see people who don't do science you know they they'll just take some ad libs from scientists in terms of their their opposition to philosophy but not understanding that philosophy is critical to science you can't do science without philosophy because philosophy helps you to make more well-formed um research questions it helps you to uh to articulate better whether your research is sound or not because philosophy has to fundamentally deal with argumentation that's why philosophy and mathematics and, and logic they're all one and the same and so in order to even even articulate scientific phenomena you have to withdraw on philosophy and mathematics which is not science And so, you know, I've already had a discussion on the channel about why mathematics is not science. But this this plays an important in terms of the, the generative thought experiments that that emerge and they and that they design in terms of their logical conclusions, and then they're able to design research, excuse me, design research methods and um and to develop instruments to see if the hypotheses generated from the mathematical and logical and philosophical conclusions that inspired the research in the first place you know and so you know uh my gray hairs are starting to come in you know you, you're starting to see them come in more but a lot of people think i'm young and so you know i'm in my 43rd year and I've been doing this seriously since 16. That's, that's, that's 27 years. And so when you think about 27 years of systematic research and, and what I've had to learn through that process and all of the schooling that I had to do, all the schooling that I'm still doing right now, formally in universities and going to conferences and writing papers and being rejected for papers and getting critiques, you know this this isn't an overnight thing i'm 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 you know i'm not trying to boast something but i'm not really your average youtuber when it comes to the information these these scholars i've been building relationships with for years been seeing them at conferences getting their numbers and having conversations they've been sharing stuff with me if they're not immediately in my, even if they're in my field you know they've been sharing stuff with me and and so what I try to do is, is to bring the conversations that I have in academia to the public and trying to get enough of us up to speed so that when we're making these public arguments that, you know, these children who are trying to find knowledge itself, that they have solid information to ground themselves on and, and, and not listen to the loonies who, who are anti-African who would try to summarily dismiss African scholarship without engaging it critically or without engaging the culture. You have people who are, who are so-called, you know, super black and West African, don't engage in any West African culture, ain't initiated into any uh, religious spiritual system. You know, people mad at folks for uh, talking about ancient Egypt, but everybody who I know who, who studies and um and and likes to big up and talk about ancient egypt a lot all of them are initiated in west african systems 
damn near everyone. We do both. But the ones who are making the critiques, not one of them initiating any African systems, not grounded in any African culture, don't study any African language. And this is a fact. And they wonder why they miss some of these critical things when we're having these conversations about Africa and, and the richness and diversity of it is. It says, are right, making it necessary? Okay. Uh, it says, yep, you can't just dismiss. It says, excellent presentation. I'll be at the conference on both days. I personally like putting money in African scholars' pockets. And thank you. You're welcome. That's it was an existential imperialism. Uh, he says, if sound correspondence is the only way to demonstrate and support genetic relationships and there is no such correspondences, then Eurocentric scholars are in trouble. So uh, click, click. Uh, he says, right. Um, pre present the arguments, then hash out the correctness of the claims through the peer review process. Indeed. Uh, he says, Africa schoolhouse rock. <laughs> So I saw I will say the same thing I said weeks ago and people will assume they never heard it because you ain't got that good country twang when you say it like I do. You know, you got to You got to be from third ward H town and then they'll listen. The Tennessee in the building. Field theory. Uh oh. Uh, have you written on the use of technology uh, for African development? Um, yes and no. Not really in depth, but only in a, in the sense of um, encouraging African people to study biomimicry, uh, and I have a chapter on that in Illusion Volume Two. Uh, so he had a hard piece of it. He's are you a Sagittarius or is somebody trying to get their uh, flirt on? I don't even know who uh, New Sarah is, but um, let me see. Uh, I also studied OMAC or pre Maya language as well. As I see some of I appreciate your work, but we disagree. Indeed. Uh, let me see. Uh, I believe the OMAC has not been deciphered. And so if you're getting your information from Clyde Winters, throw all that in the trash. I'm saying that publicly. Um, let me see. You know, I'm doing a qualitative research project now and it's kicking my butt. Indeed, people think re research is not for the weary. You know, it takes a lot of brain power. Uh, so philosophy of science is imperative. Good point. Indeed. Following the question towards research. Uh, skip that. Understanding that there are different ways of knowing outside of science. Y'all still going? I went to grocery shopping. Yep. Two hours and 33 minutes. Uh, this is not Scott. I don't know what y'all talking about. It says, no, I'm wrong with you. I'm not, <laughs> my bad, my bad. All right. You know, when you when you ask somebody their zodiac sign, at least back in my day, that's that's what we that's what we was doing. We was trying to see what the sister what's what's her uh zodiac makeup. And uh let me see. It's a subscription. It's a science. And it's a, uh, indeed. All righty. Well, um, I think I'm going to end there. I do appreciate each and every one of you joining the program. And I look forward to the next conversation. And, you know, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe and make sure that you like and big up the video. And y'all have a blessed week. All right. Peace.
reality breaking down all my fantasies It would be nice if I at least had one fantasy The neutrality about to take a terabyte From the American apple pie better get a slice It's kinda scary the way that this life is moving on Marvin's doing backflips inside his grave what's going on We have head on collisions not seeing another's vision Maybe that's the reason why some colors fit the description A lot of relationships need life rafts sinking ships I guess you just can't have only one like potato chips I would love for you to listen with an open heart But would you really 